We're thinking then uh, this evening uh, of this big question about Christianity. Is the Bible God's word? Now I recall as a teenager, an older Christian in my church, gathering some of the young people around him and telling us this story in his Australian accent to encourage us to believe that the Bible is the word of God. He said a Christian was reading the Bible on a train. Another passenger began questioning him about the Bible being the word of God. All of the old chestnuts, some of which we will consider this evening, were raised, such as not having the original manuscripts or the Bible being full of contradictions. Now, this Christian on the train did his best to defend his belief that the Bible is the word of God. Mile after mile, he was questioned, verbally abused for his belief. The passenger asserted that the Bible could not be trusted. Now eventually, and this is no recommendation here, this is just what happened. Eventually, the Christian closed his Bible, stood up, and went over to the skeptic. The Christian took his his two knuckles and put them around the nose of the skeptic and twisted hard. A spurt of blood flew out of the skeptic's nose. The Christian then quoted Proverbs chapter 30, verse 33. Pressing the nose produces blood. There, the Christian said to the skeptic, is something that is true in the Bible. Now, our first question in this series of big questions about Christianity is, is the Bible God's word? It's an important question, and maybe you are asking it this evening. As you may imagine, various opinions have been held on this point over the centuries. The Samaritans, for example, you remember the Good Samaritan, they believed only the first five books of the Bible to be the Word of God. In the second century AD, an influential theologian called Marcion, and he was influential, taught that only some parts of the Old Testament and New Testament were the Word of God. Roman Catholicism, as we all know, adds the apocryphal books to the 66 books, claiming that they also are from God. The predominant view among Bible scholars today is that the Bible is merely the writings of fallible men. Amy Orr Ewing described her examination by Oxford University professors before her graduation in theology. They ridiculed her belief that the Bible was the word of God. Many religious leaders today consider the Bible to be just one of many sacred books, albeit useful to us for teaching good morals. To them, the Hindu Vedas books are as as useful and authoritative as the Christian Bible. The fastest growing religion in the UK, Islam, claims that their holy book, the Quran, is the word of God. Mormons also claim that their holy book, the Book of Mormon, is God's word. How then can we be sure that the Christian Bible and only the Bible, which we hold in our hands, access on our phones, read on our tablets, is the very word of God. For members in in our denomination, uh, this claim is our first term of membership. It reads, I believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the word of God. So if you're a member in the Reformed Presbyterian Church, you claim to believe that the Bible is God's word. But can you defend that claim? And how does that claim affect your life? This talk aims to confirm that conviction. And if you don't believe the Bible is God's word, to show you the reasonableness of believing this, we'll consider scripture, reason, some objections, and then some practical applications. And I said last time, by that stage, you'll be really ready for the refreshments next door. 
Firstly, let's think of Scripture. We begin by considering how the Bible describes itself. What claims does it make for its own contents? In coming to Scripture, we're focusing on the two clearest passages which claim the Bible is the very Word of God, the ones which we have read, one by Paul, one by Peter. Firstly, the passage from Paul in 2 Timothy. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Let's think of the term Scripture and then the term breathed out by God. Scripture occurs 51 times in the New Testament. It's a technical word which means sacred writings as translated in verse 15, the previous verse. The apostle is not here referring to all the popular writings of his time, for example, by Homer, Plato, or Socrates. He's thinking of a specific collection of religious writings considered by Christians to be sacred. Because they were given by God. Thus the title we use is the Holy Bible. The sacred collection of books. The special technical term scripture is to be understood therefore as referring to all the 39 Old Testament books and the 27 New Testament books. In 1 Timothy 5, the Gospel of Luke is called scripture. In 2 Peter 3, the writings of Paul are called Scripture. So the term Scripture here refers to all the books of God that had been written or that would be written. And so for us tonight, it refers to the 66 books of our Bible, Scripture. And what does he say about this collection of sacred writings? He says they were breathed out by God. This is, and here's a big word for you, anthropomorphism. That is a human action ascribed to God. God is spirit and does not speak or breathe as we do. But the image Paul uses of God here is the action of speech. These sacred writings were breathed out by God. Speech is breath passing through our vocal cords. So the point he is making is that the words of Scripture written down in these sacred writings on the page, papyrus, or scroll are the very words God intended to be there. As if, as if, as if he had audibly spoken them to the writers with breath through vocal cords. The words that left his mouth, as it were, are the very words that landed on the manuscript. There is nothing lost between the mouth of God and the manuscript of the men who wrote them down. This is the clearest claim in Scripture to the Bible being the Word of God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. The second passage from Peter supports this assertion by Paul. Peter writes, Prophecy is men who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The word prophecy in Peter's writing there refers to the Old Testament scriptures. The assertion is that the books of the Old Testament originated not by man's private interpretation of his circumstances, but from the very mouth of God. The book of Isaiah, which we're studying in church, is not the private thoughts of Isaiah on the might of Assyria, on the circle of the earth, or on the coming of the Messiah. He was carried, Peter says, along by the Holy Spirit when he wrote his book. This phrase carried along is a maritime metaphor of a ship being carried by the wind. There is the ship sitting still in the bay with anchor up and sails open but unmoving, waiting for the wind to blow. 
So the holy prophets in Old Testament times, Moses, David, Ezekiel, went about their business. They prayed. They worshipped. They went for a walk. They ate their lunch. They carried on their normal business. But now and again, the Holy Spirit came on them and compelled them to write down the sacred writings. A psalm today. An historical narrative tomorrow. A prophecy another time. They couldn't write scripture on their own, Peter says. With their own considerable literary skills. They could only speak from God by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. The claims of Peter and Paul are very clear, aren't they? That the Bible is the very word of God. The fact that they both use metaphors. Paul, the metaphor of speech. Peter, the metaphor of sailing, does not throw doubt on their claims. Rather, these metaphors indicate that they are attempting to explain a miracle. The miracle of what we call inspiration. And any miracle cannot be explained in merely technical language. Thus the metaphors communicate the truth of the miracle of inspiration in the only and best way possible. This view of the Bible asserted by Paul and Peter is confirmed by the way the New Testament writers refer to the Old Testament. And I encourage you to slow down in your reading of the Bible. If you read the Bible, when you come to a quotation from the Old Testament and consider the preface to the quotation. In the preface, the author often reveals his view of the nature of the writings that he is quoting. Here are some examples. In Matthew 1, 21, the apostle Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 7 and he prefaces the quotation with the words, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. In this preface to the Old Testament quote, the apostle indicates he considered the book of Isaiah to be the very word of God. So in Hebrews 3, the quote from Psalm 95, the writer writes before the quotation, as the Holy Spirit says, not just the godly King David, but the Holy Spirit says. It's important to realize that this is not an opinion imposed on the Old Testament books by the New Testament writers to gain a following in the first century, but rather the Old Testament writers themselves were conscious of being the very mouthpieces of God. The phrase, thus says the Lord, occurs 1,700 times in the Old Testament. In one place, David says explicitly, the spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is in my tongue, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. They were conscious of communicating the very words of God. From this consideration of the Bible's claims for itself, While you may reject the assertion that the Bible is the word of God, you cannot deny that it clearly claims for itself to be the word of God. And for those of us who believe it is the word of God, these claims assure us of our conviction. It's not a view imposed on the Bible by the church, but it is the view of Scripture of itself. But pause for a moment and think of the implications of this claim of the Bible. One serious implication is that the Bible cannot be a good book if it is not God's book. If its claims to be God's book are false, which many assert is the case, then it cannot be a reliable guide on morals. None of us here would act on the advice of a known liar. 
And why should we follow the teachings of the Bible on ethics if its claims about itself are false? Secondly, supporting evidence. We don't accept the Bible to be the word of God because the church universal recognizes the Bible as God's word, but the universal recognition of the church confirms our conviction. The story of the formation of what is known as the canon of scripture, a Latin term for rule, that is the books which met a criteria established by the church, is a fascinating story. There was no blind faith or quick acceptance by the church of the books that are now regarded as being part of Scripture. The chief point for us here is to recognize that the church did not make the books of the Bible the Word of God. They only recognized them as God's Word, set apart from other books written by church leaders. There were many other books in the early centuries considered useful to the Christian life by the church, such as the Shepherd of Hermes. But only the 66 books were considered by the church as being from God. Some books were slow to be recognized. Such was the care and diligence of the church in this process. The Old Testament book of Esther, which does not mention the name of God. The book of Proverbs, which contains a seeming contradiction in chapter 25. These books were slowly recognized to be from God. But by the time of Jesus, the 39 books of the Old Testament were recognized as being canonical, meeting this rule, being those books from God, which the apostles quote from. The New Testament books were agreed by the church in the East and West by the end of the 4th century. The key issue determining which books were recognized as from God by the church was the involvement of an apostle. Was it written by a direct representative of Jesus or by an associate of an apostle as Mark and Luke were? In accepting the Bible then as the word of God, We are in line with the believers closest to the time of their writing. Now it is true that some writers are only appreciated centuries after their time. Rabbi Burns, for example. But many outstanding writers are appreciated in their time. Dickens, Tennyson, Yeats were recognized by their own generation as highly gifted. Across the evangelical church today, there are different views among evangelicals about the second coming of Jesus or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there is full agreement about the 66 books of our Bible being given by God. This encourages us in our conviction. If we were the only people or the only denomination holding on to this position we would really have to consider our conviction. The recognition by the church supports the claims of Scripture. Secondly, archaeology. One of the marks of the Bible being the Word of God must be inerrancy on every level, historically, geographically, scientifically. And this is where other religious books fall down. The apocryphal books, the Quran, and the Book of Mormon are full of historical inaccuracies. And so when the Roman Catholic Church appeals to the Apocrypha for support for its doctrine of purgatory, I am really skeptical. But the Bible has been repeatedly shown to be inerrant, even on an historical level. One instance of this concerns Pontius Pilate. Liberal critics disbelieved the four Gospels' accounts of the trial of Jesus by Pilate because no record of Pilate existed outside of the Bible. And so they claimed the trial of Jesus was a fascinating tale invented by the followers of Jesus. But in 1961... 
A group of Italian archaeologists discovered a marble pillar in Palestine with the inscription, Pilate, governor of Judea. Such an inscription does not make the gospel accounts true, but it shows that they are true. Similar data concerns the existence of King David. Until 2012, it was fashionable to dismiss King David as a key figure in the Bible, an interesting myth or legend in Jewish writings. However, a stele was found in 2012 with the words, the heights of David, dated by experts to 50 years after the death of King David, confirming the historical accuracy of the Bible. Fulfilled prophecy is another supporting piece for the Bible being God's word. Events predicted hundreds of years before they happened indicate the writer was lucky or that God foretold these events. The sheer scale of the prophecies indicate that the former cannot be the case. More than 300 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled by the coming of Jesus alone. Professor Peter Stoner used to be a skeptic. He chose to study eight of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming of Jesus in order to disprove the Bible and strengthen his skepticism. He calculated that the likelihood of these eight prophecies being fulfilled were one in ten to the power of 17. That's 17 zeros after it. During his study, Seeing the amazing and detailed fulfillment of prophecy given hundreds of years before and considering the unlikelihood of them being fulfilled, he became a Christian. We do not know the future. We cannot predict detailed events for the UK, for the United States, or for China hundreds of years from now. Isaiah did. Ezekiel did. Not with their own wisdom or fortune, but because God gave them the words. Inspiration came upon them. The National Lottery illustrates our inability. It has six numbers. The chances of predicting them correctly is one in 14 million. Basically, None of us have any chance, and anyone who does predict them is just sheer coincidence. But the prophecies of the Old Testament, given hundreds of years before in such detail, supports our claim that the Bible is the very Word of God. But a fourth supporting evidence before we come to the the objections is the witness of the Spirit. The chief conviction that the Bible is the word of God comes not from outside of ourselves, but from the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. As we read scripture, we hear the authoritative voice of God speaking to us by his spirit, comforting and challenging us. The Bible is a living book to believers and we are persuaded by the Holy Spirit that it is the word of God. Our church confession emphasizes this point, and I quote a small section of it in chapter 1.5. Our full persuasion, it says, and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Spirit, bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. This is probably the answer that you would have given at the start I believe the Bible is the word of God because God speaks to me through it. A verse jumps out at you and directs your behavior, you claim. Unconverted people do not have the spirit and do not experience God speaking to them in the Bible. 
Paul writes, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them. Jesus says, it is only his sheep that hear his voice. I remember a Mormon telling me of his conversion to Mormonism. He read the Book of Mormon and had a warm feeling, a burning in his heart, which persuaded him that it was true. But what the Christian experiences, the witness of the Spirit in our hearts, is different from a warm feeling. It is a personal communication with the living God. Every Christian here could testify of moments when God spoke to them from his word. Besides, if you challenged a Mormon on the historical accuracy of the Book of Mormon, he would simply respond that he had an experience that persuaded him that the Book of Mormon was true, even though every other historian differs from the Book of Mormon on the history of America. That blind faith, That tunnel vision of Mormonism is very different to what we are saying about the experience of a Christian. We are saying that the Bible is shown to be the word of God by the supernatural witness of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's heart and by the historical accuracy, fulfilled prophecy and united recognition of the church. Sinclair Ferguson, for example, was reading the Bible as a teenager. Suddenly the words of John 5 gripped his heart. He says, I was arrested by these words. God spoke to him directly. Augustine was wrestling with faith. He loved his sin too much to give it up, but he wanted to become a Christian. Out in a garden one day he heard words from children playing over the fence Take up and read. He lifted his Bible, opened it at Romans chapter 13. Put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its desires. The point of the supporting evidence is that we are not called to a blind faith in believing that the Bible is the word of God. It's not a leap of faith, but it is grounded in rational argument. The claim can be backed up with a mass of supporting evidence. Let's think thirdly of some objections. Perhaps you're sitting there and and, and you've been listening to this and you say, well, come on now, come on now. This is a circular argument. The claim that the Bible is the word of God because the Bible claims it to be the word of God is a circular argument. And you're right. It is a circular argument. But it cannot be anything else because the Bible is the final authority. The Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, or Sinclair Ferguson are not the final authority. We do not believe the Bible is the Word of God because they claim it is the Word of God. The Bible itself is the highest authority, the final authority. No one is above it to say this is the word of God. The Bible is the end of the line. And so it's legitimate for us to believe the Bible is the word of God because it claims to be the word of God. We believe the explanations given about the zebra's migration across Africa, traveling 250 kilometers, what's that, Uh, 150 miles for some years, at the feeding grounds in rainy seasons as being an inbuilt urge because respected scientists, experts in this field, top men, top women, give that explanation. A parent doesn't always have to explain to their child why she has to wear a coat. The parent is the highest authority in the home. So here, God tells us the nature of his word because he is the highest authority. A second objection is about contradictions. 
infidel.com website claims there are 101 contradictions in the Bible and there are many other sites devoted to this very subject. And there are apparent contradictions in the Bible. So you ask, how then can the Bible be the word of God? Some contradictions can be answered. For others, we have to say that we await further information to come to light to answer those particular issues. Let me give you two examples. The case of the death of Judas is cited as one contradiction. The Gospels say that he hanged himself. The book of Acts say that his bowels fell out. The answer given by scholars is that at the south side of Jerusalem, branches grew over a 25-foot cliff, suggesting that Judas did hang himself on one of these trees. Perhaps the branches broke and he fell down the cliff and his bowels spilled out. Another case of contradiction is 1 Corinthians 10 verse 8. It claims 23,000 died, a reference to Numbers 21. But in Numbers 21 it says 24,000 died. The answer to this discrepancy seems to be that Paul leaves out the thousand leaders inciting the lower number. Often there is an explanation but New Testament writers still consider the Old Testament to be the word of God. A third and, and the final objection is about the manuscripts. We don't have the original manuscripts, only copies of them. And so it is asked of us, how then can we claim that the Bible is the word of God? Our claim is that only the manuscripts were given by inspiration of God, not the copies or the translations. The earliest fragment of the New Testament is the Rylands fragment, which dates to 125 AD, containing verses from John 18. So how then can we claim to have the word of God? We recognize that the wisdom in not having the original manuscripts as idolatry might ensue. We recognize the naturalness in not having the original manuscripts through wear and tear. But though we don't have the original manuscripts, we can be assured of the accuracy of the copies. Consider just for a moment the Old Testament copies. In the early 20th century, liberals questioned the claim that we had an accurate Bible. Even though the copies of the Old Testament were produced by the Masoretes with meticulous care, they counted the middle word of every line, the middle word of every book. Yet, their copy of the Old Testament was dated to 916 AD. Malachi wrote in 400 BC. The Old Testament manuscript was 916 AD. The liberals asked, how can we accept that this is an accurate copy of the Old Testament? Then, as you know, in February 1947, a Bedouin shepherd boy seeking his lost goats in the Dead Sea Valley, eight miles south of Jericho, threw a stone into a cave and heard a crash. He came back with others and found 40,000 fragments preserved in jars dating to 125 BC. They contained a copy of every Old Testament book except the book of Esther. The manuscripts were the very same text as the 918 AD text of the Masoretes. And this, this gave confidence to the Christian church that the texts between 400 BC when Malachi wrote and the latest copy, 125 AD, were, were also accurate. As for the New Testament copies, there are 24,000 manuscripts and fragments for the text of the New Testament. 
The writings of the early church fathers contain 86,000 quotes from the Bible, and we can reconstruct the whole of the New Testament from their writings, except for 20 verses. The many fragments and church fathers' writings agree on 97% of the text of the New Testament. By contrast, for example, the writings of Plato have only seven manuscripts and date from 1,200 years after he wrote. Therefore, the absence of the original manuscripts should be no barrier to us to accepting that the Bible is the Word of God. The Scripture, the supporting evidence, some objections, and lastly, application. What should our response to the Bible being the Word of God be? We should read it, every part of it. I remember a church elder handing no, 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 no one here, no one here. I remember a church elder handing me his Bible to read in his home. The portion I wanted to read was from Lamentations, but the pages of his Bible and Lamentations were stuck together. We laughed about it, but I thought about it after. We could be selective in our Bible reading. So let us choose a manageable Bible reading plan that takes us through the whole Bible. There's lots of them online. It's a very basic response to our belief that the Bible is God's word. All of us would agree with the sentiments of Sir Walter Scott on his deathbed. He was a great collector of books and he asked his son to bring him the book. His son replied, well, which book, father? Sir Walter said, there is only one. But we need to demonstrate that conviction in our life. Read it. Believe it. All of it. God knows better than us. As an Ikea set of instructions will help you build your purchase better, your bed, your chair, whatever it might be, so the Bible, the word of our maker, will help us build our lives better. This year, in first year, Region RE exam includes a question on self-identity. And we discussed this in our home and came to the Bible that, that we would understand ourselves from God's word, what he says about us, and we would believe what he says about us. That the Christian is created in God's image. That the Christian has sinned, that the Christian has been saved by God's grace, that the Christian is united to Christ, that the Christian is destined for heaven. All is God's word. So let us believe every last word. Let's obey it. Let the word of God become the rule of your life. Not the popular opinion of society or the behavior of your peers or your own fallen instincts. Let us submit to the holy and wise word of God. All of us have prayed the prayer of Augustine, either vocally or in our mind. Lord, make me holy, but not yet. Some sin we want to hold on to. But in our reflection on this study this evening, that the Bible is God's word, let us respond by obeying it. And lastly, let us share it. Be willing to stand up for the doctrine and practice of God's word on the transport you use, in the team that you play with. Use the strengths that you have. If you have the gift of the gab, then go on a go team. If you have bulging biceps, go on a relief team. If you have a flair for languages, consider Bible translation. Let us share the holy word of God. But maybe you're not yet a Christian. Perhaps you've respect for the Bible. You maybe even believe that it's God's word, but you've not yet repented and believed in Jesus. You know the Bible summons you to do that, but you have not yet done that. You know that repentance and faith in Jesus is not an option, not a preference, but a command. But you have not submitted to God or obeyed this command. 
You've done many things that the government have asked of you. You pay your taxes. You buy your TV license. You get your MOT. But the God of heavens summons to repent and believe in Jesus. You've yet rejected. Steve Stevens was a World War II Spitfire pilot. He got shot down. And his plane landed in the sea, plummeting down to 400 meters. And in the depths of the sea, his mind was drawn to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Steve, in the depths of his predicament and in the depths of the ocean, believed in that moment, obeyed. The command of God received his grace. How about you? Not in the depths of the ocean in desperate trouble, but in a comfortable church building. Respond to the authoritative word of God to repent and believe in Jesus and have everlasting life.